Hello everybody around the world and in Australia and in Albany where I am. Uh, welcome to this special um, guided metta meditation uh, dedication for Ajahn Brahm. <coughs> and um, this meditation I've been asked to do by the BSWA as a special gift uh, for Ajahn Brahm's 70th birthday. I've um, uh, been a fully ordained bhikkhu with Ajahn Brahm for almost eight years and uh, a couple of years ago Ajahn Brahm's uh, monastery in Serpentine was getting very full with monks and there was no space for new monks. I put up my hand to come down to Albany um, to teach meditation here and to start a branch monastery. And we're actually here with all of our meditators or some of our meditators from Albany that come on Friday night. So if it's coming across extra powerfully strong, it's not just me. It's all these extra meditators here as well. Next point. So that's me, Venerable Mudu. Um, I have my own way of doing metta meditation and I do it here every Friday night. I went on a meditation um, retreat once, nine-day meditation retreat with Bhante Sajato, one of the senior monks from our tradition who lives in um, over east uh, in Victoria, I think, somewhere uh, with uh, another monk. And we did the, he taught the metta meditation under the uh, style of his, one of his teachers, Ajahn Chachai, a famous Thai monk who teaches uh, meditation, uh, metta meditation. And <coughs> Bhante Sajado, um, uh, one of the advantages he found with metta meditation was that it was very quick to find um, peace and stillness came up very quick for him. And this kind of very um, uh, leaning towards a still mind very quickly and a bright mind. He found this, uh, um, that it tended towards uh, these nimittas coming up in the mind, these bright lights in the mind came up a lot quicker for him doing metta meditation than any other type of meditation. But his style was to wish, um, wish others well. So there's this form of meditation which is probably the most common metta meditation where you kind of go through the meditation by may I be well, may I be happy. You announce that in your mind. And then you move to others, may my mother be well, may my mother be happy. You mean it with your heart, you say it in your meditation so your eyes are closed and you visualize the image of your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather, your great mother, great grandmother, great grandfather. May they be well, may they be happy. And then you move to other people like um, acquaintances and then you move to people that maybe you have a problematic relationship with and you try to have this feeling of meta towards them. You try to put aside your feeling of ill will and you build on metta. And I remember um, uh, also learning metta meditation with Ajahn Brahm. One of the techniques he said was to, um, uh, you know, when you get this, this uh, metta meditation going, it's quite, um, for some people they've never done it before, it feels a bit unnatural. Maybe for, for guys, you know, may this person be well. It sounds a bit, a bit, a bit fluffy. It's not particularly masculine type of kind of uh, phrases to say. And I remember Ajahn Brahm saying that at a med meditation session. He didn't do a retreat. He did one day on a nine day retreat teaching metta. And his uh, suggestion was to use a fake it till you make it. And it actually works. So if you don't fully feel that, just, just say it anyway. And after a while you'll brainwash yourself and you will, you will start to actually have kind feelings towards the person maybe you had a difficult relationship with, maybe a family member, maybe someone for work. But my meditation, meta meditation I do is um, uh, every day I meditate is to have meta towards myself. And that I do in the form of a body sweep meditation going through each part of the body. And the reason I do that is um, because uh, it's the way Ajahn Brahm taught me to meditate. And uh, I had success with that. And, and I, fig I figured 
if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's an old mechanic saying. And uh, so if it's not broke, don't fix it. That works for me. Uh, what I do with my meta meditation is the body sweep meditation. Everyone's heard of it. Some people may not even realize it is a form of meta, especially if you follow some of Ajahn Brahm's um, um, techniques of meditation, which is, or not techniques, um, style of meditation or emphasis on meditation, which is the emphasis on kindness and um, gratitude and compassion. They're the sorts of things Ajahn Brahm always teaches. <clears throat> and that appeals to me, this, uh, the kindness and compassion that Ajahn Brahm teaches in meditation. Uh, maybe I didn't really realize it at first, but after many years of practice, I realized, yes, this does actually work. So the way I do it is through my body sweep. And I, when we go through this in the next step of the meditation, in the meditation proper, I will guide it just like I do every Friday night. And you'll see how much kindness I bring to the body. Because for me, the more kindness I bring to the body, the more kindness I'm bringing to my mind, the more kindness I bring to myself then, and to my mind, the more the mind will want to hang out with you. And it won't want to run away and play monkey mind, going to the left, going to the right, going into the future, going into the past. When you're kind to your mind, as kind as possible, and you just, you just uh, slap the kindness on, just lather it on real thick, like icing on a cake. Just put it on really thick. You don't scrimp with icing on a cake. See, my whole meditation is metta. This is kindness to my body. So this is what we're gonna do in our meditation today. And I move from my feet, then to my calf muscles, my knees, and then, and then I always go into my tummy and ask how my tummy is feeling. And sometimes, you know, yeah, you might have some some irritation there or something, uh, uh, some tightness, some tension. And uh, Ajahn Brahm explains or suggests that you just find that part of the body and just focus in on it and send it kindness. And kindness is metta. So this is my metta meditation. It's, I focus on my own body and um, I be as kind as I can to it. And once the body is relaxed as it can, then I move my awareness inside into my mind and I've, I've already generated all this kindness. So I bring that with me into my mind and my mind sees me and says, oh, hello, Moodoo. Nice to have you come and visit me again. And, you're, and, and it sees the kindness and it, go, and it doesn't run for the hills, run away because it just stays with me. And so then you have this really nice meditation because you bring metta with you, you bring kindness with you into the mind the mind wants to hang out with you and stay with you. The basic essence of my metta is I bring all this kindness through my body first and then move into the mind. And the other benefit of having um, this body sweep meditation and bringing this kindness to it is that you, um, it brings you into what every meditator may have heard but may not understand fully is it brings you into the present moment. You need this present moment to stop the mind from wandering. If you don't have your mind in the present moment, the mind wanders off all over the place. So as you're focusing on your toes, your feet, your ankles, your knees, the mind doesn't wander off anywhere because you're actually on this one point of the body. So it doesn't wander, so you're in the present moment. So it's a real, it's a real benefit. I found if I skipped the body scan meditation, I wasn't giving enough emphasis on being in the present moment and meditations never worked as good. So just like when people offer dana to the monks, um, you can offer the, the merit that you make through your meditation to others. You can send that merit to all beings. You may have heard that it's almost like a cliche saying in Buddhism, may all beings be well, may all beings be happy. I wish someone could come up with something original, but that's what they all say. This is what uh, Sometimes Buddhism has quite a few cliches. That's one of them, but it, I don't demean it any less by saying that, but um, that's what you can do with your practice offering. You can dedicate it to others. And why? Would, what are you dedicating to others and how are you making virtue? You're making virtue because when, on a, on a basic level, you're, um, 
by meditating, you're spending half an hour or however long you meditate, um, you're, um, you're not harming others. You're, you're generating peace in your mind and what a wonderful gift that is to the world. So that's virtue and you can offer it to others. That's your gift to the world, this gift of peace that you're generating in your mind. And you, may, you, can, you can offer it to others in your meditation, which we'll do in the guidance coming up. But you also have this residue of peace that you carry around with you after you do the meditation, when you see your friends and family for the next couple of days or weeks or however long you kind of maintain your peaceful mind for. So you walk out of this meditation hall, you go to um, take that peace with you and share it with others. Your mother, your father, brothers and sisters, they're like, gee, my brother or sister's not as um, easily um, agitated. I can't press his buttons anymore. Why is he so calm and that? Oh, because he's meditating. He or she's meditating. It's true, it works. Ajahn Brahm tells a story once um, about the, uh, the husband who wanted to go on the meditation retreat. And the wife said, no, you can't go. I need you here. You got to do this, you got to do that. You got these jobs to do. How can you go? That's so selfish of you. You can't go on meditation retreat. Husband said, oh, okay then. Waited till the next meditation retreat. Dear wife, can I please go on the meditation retreat? I really want to go and learn meditation and, um, and uh, get some peace. You're so selfish, she said. You can't go on meditation retreat. You're just thinking about yourself. What about me? I'm here, I've got all these jobs to do. I look after all the kids and all this sort of stuff. No, you can't go on meditation retreat. But in Buddhism, we do things three times. So on the third time, the next meditation retreat came along. Dear wife, can I please go on the meditation retreat? Oh, off you go then. You know, all you do is think about yourself. You go on the meditation retreat and, and we'll stay here and do all the jobs and I'll be looking after the kids and driving them here and there. And uh, so he's like, yes, I get to go on Ajahn Brahm meditation retreat. So he goes on the Ajahn Brahm meditation retreat and when he came back from the retreat, he was calmer, he was, he was, he was um, more, less reactive, um, he didn't get as angry and upset, all these wonderful things. And the wife said to him, when's the next meditation retreat? You can go on, <laughs> you can go on as many of those meditation retreats as you like. So that was the uh, practice offering, the benefits and virtues of practice offering can help others so not even including when you send your meta out to others you also when you leave here you go back home and other family members benefit as well and it's nice to pay respect to our Dharma teachers because without them we wouldn't have the uh, the instructions so if we didn't have the monks down here in Albany then um, there would be um, yeah we wouldn't be able to teach meditation so people wouldn't get that benefit of it of um, meditation taught under the Buddhist, by Buddhist monks. And you can't get kind of closer to the teachings of the way Buddha taught, then uh, that you can't get much closer than from a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist nun. So it's very nice to have, um, to pay respects to our teachers, whoever they are. Ajahn Brahm is a teacher deserving utmost respect because um, his teachings are awesome. Um, I came across his teachings uh, maybe 15 years ago and, um, and uh, they just helped me so much. I was actually going through family law court at the time. Uh, 12 years I spent in family law court. It was a very, very difficult time fighting over the ch children and uh, it causes a lot of stress. And sometimes even blokes and sometimes people, men and women, will commit suicide because of the outcomes of family law court. Because you can't chop kids in half and have half each. They end up having to go to one parent and that can cause a lot of um, uh, heartache for people. So yeah, I had the family law court to deal with for 12 years. It caused, it was, um, caused me a lot of heartache <coughs> and, and I couldn't find any other uh, teachings that would deal with some of those pains and until I found um, teaching of meditation and 
it helped 100%. What I say to the meditators down here is that um, learning to turn the volume knob down on your um, pain levels. So just because you practice meditation or you practice Buddhism and virtue, it still means you suffer, but the, the amount you suffer, the, um, the amplitude, the amount of pain you feel from the suffering, when you have a good practice, you can turn that volume knob down. It, it, like it doesn't register as much anymore when pain, when, when you deal with um, um, dukkha, suffering. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt as much. And even the arahats, there's a famous saying, if they're asked how they're feeling or how they're going, they say, uh, suffering arising, suffering passing away. So even enlightened beings, suffering arising, suffering passing away. They just notice it come and notice it go, but the volume knob of their suffering is, is down a lot. It doesn't hurt as much. So when Ajahn Brahm taught me meditation and then later on uh, he, he allowed me to become a monk and also to um, uh, practice deeper as a as a um, as a, uh, a monastic. My respect for him is is huge, because it just was just so. Uh, it's kind of life saving, and other monks may mention this. I mentioned it to the meditators here just a while ago that um, you know, people send him emails and letters. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. I watched your YouTube video and you saved my life. And I, I kid you not, as he. He told the monks recently that he had to um, empty his filing cabinet of all those letters. They were overflowing from, the <laughs> from letters all around the world of people that um, their lives had been saved by his, uh, his teachings, which are humorous and compassionate and uh, easy to listen to. So he's a legend, as we say in Australia. So yes, this is all being done to mark um, Ajahn Brahm's 70th birthday and his grati the gratitude we have for him um, bringing his teachings and also for him bringing monks and nuns. We have nuns as well for bringing monks and nuns into Australia and around the world. Because he doesn't just support the monks here in Australia and nuns in Australia, he supports them all over the world. But he used to get invited to places like Google you know, because they're right into making, helping their um, uh, staff um, be happy and be, um, have pleasant, peaceful minds. So he got invited to Google and because they're a big organisation, they gave a very large donation. And because they said to Ajahn Brahm, you know, you can put this donation wherever you like, he said, straight to the nuns in California. So it didn't come back here for the monks or the nuns here in Australia. It went to the, the nuns in California. There's two nuns at the time that were there that were struggling because um, the nuns, um, uh, yeah, in, historically, it's been harder for them to get support. So that whole big donation and some of these companies like Google, they, they donate big. Um, Facebook were around the corner apparently in this Silicon Valley or wherever, wherever Google is. And they heard Ajahn Brahm was in town. Oh, Ajahn Brahm, please come and see us as well. So I don't need to explain how popular Ajahn Brahm is. He's, um, he's very well received all over the world. So now we're gonna do meta meditation. Get comfortable in, in, in your seat or on the floor or wherever you'd like to meditate when you're comfortable. Um, please close your eyes. And with the eyes closed, just just keep in mind that uh, I'm going to. This is this is a this is my style, Venerable Mudu style of meta meditation. Is bringing meta to the body, bringing kindness and compassion to the body. And I like to do that first by just acknowledging each of the five senses. Um, making contact with them. First I make contact with the sense door of the eye and with the eyes closed there is still uh, there's still visual imagery that comes through 
into your brain. <clears throat> so I ask myself, uh, what do I see? What kind of, what's going on there? Is there patterns or shades of light? This is just making some sort of sense contact with that sense door. <clears throat> And then I move to the next of the five senses, or the next two actually, which is the sense door of the tongue, the sense door of the nose. And I ask myself, uh, what do they, um, what am I noticing in smell and taste? Usually there's, there's not much sensual sensory stimuli there. You may have just had a cup of tea or <coughs> some juice so you might notice the taste of that still there, but generally it's not a lot to notice there. So I'll move on to the next, the five senses, the sense door of the ear. I notice the sounds around me. It uh, backs onto this uh, beautiful um, pond with horses behind us. In the summer we can normally hear those, but in the winter we've got the Windows closed, so I can't hear them. I just can hear the sound of the, the air conditioner keeping us warm. And I, that's an opportunity to send some meta to the air conditioner. Thank you, air conditioner, for keeping our bodies warm. But there's other noises, hums. take a moment to notice those sounds. This is bringing us into the present moment as well. Just by focusing on these five senses, our minds tend not to wander, which is a wonderful thing. The best way to start your meditation is with this meta, meta mind sweep. <coughs> Not a mind sweep, but a mind sweep. And the last of the five senses is the sense door of touch. And this is where we do this uh, kind of body sweep. So we kind of uh, gather up all of our metta. And by metta, I mean kindness, compassion, loving kindness. And I start with my toes and my feet and I ask, how are my feet and my toes? How do they feel? And they've answered back and they say, well, uh, a little bit uncomfortable. So what I do is just swap my feet around because I'm sitting cross-legged. I had one leg going over, one foot going over the other. So just swap them around. And just after doing that little bit of kindness to my feet, my feet say thank you. If I need to move my feet later on, I will do so. I listen to my body and what my body tells me to do to make it more comfortable, I do that. And by making my body as comfortable as possible, when we move our awareness later on to the mind, my body is happy to sit where it is, it's comfortable. And then I move my awareness from my toes and my feet up to my ankles. I ask my ankles how they feel. Is there any tension? Is there any tightness? Any discomfort? And if so, then please move them to a better, more comfortable position. <coughs> <clears throat> then I move this awareness of kindness to my calf muscles. And I move this uh, kindness, as I was just saying. Sometimes it, uh, you need, we need like a visual aid to help us imagine this, this kindness. And I found the best visual aid is actually imagining this kindness 
as a ball of golden light. And I can thank Ajahn Brahm for that because I think he suggested that in one of these nine day meditation retreats. So you imagine this ball of light, golden light that is, uh, it has healing properties, it's warm. And so as you move it to the part of your body that um, has pain or tightness or is tense, this uh, golden ball of light, it has this power to relieve this tension and soften this um, part of your body. And then I move that awareness, this golden light, this ball of metta up to my knees. And for me, I ask my knees how they're feeling. They're always a little bit cool. So, that's exactly why I brought this blanket with me. So, I wrap the blanket around my knees. There we go. But if you haven't got a blanket for your knees, you just move that golden uh, ball of light to your knees and imagine your knees getting warmer. And where that part of your body has been zapped with metta, you move it along to the large muscles in your upper legs. <coughs> Ask how they feel. Is there any tension or tightness there? Or are they already comfortable? And then move your awareness to uh, your hips. How do your hips feel? Some people have had uh, surgeries on their hips. Sometimes when there's nothing that can be done, then all you can do is send the kindness to that part of your body. And when you mean it with an open heart, not expecting anything in return, maybe, it, maybe this meta will make it uh, ease the comfort, maybe it won't. I'm not expecting anything in return, I'm just sending kindness there because I can. So if you have a hip like that, please send. Now send the kindness to your hip. May you, may hip, may you be well. May you be free from um, discomfort. And just imagine that uh, golden ball of light just doing its healing duties there. And from the hip, move my awareness into my tummy. And I'm not going to go through each and every single organ and piece of uh, cellular tissue there. Because there's so much going on in your tummy. So I imagine my tummy as a whole. You can imagine sending meta your own way to your tummy, but I imagine it as just my whole tummy. And I have so much compassion for my tummy because my tummy is responsible for digesting every single meal I've ever had since you know, the day I was born. And what a fantastic job my tummy has done. Why wouldn't I want to send kindness to this, this machine, this mechanism inside my body, that no matter what food I throw at it, it always says, that's okay, Moodoo. You can put an extra piece of cake in there or an extra piece of something yummy. I'll just work a little bit harder to, to digest it. That's okay. So I have gratitude, kindness, compassion for my tummy. Thank you, tummy, for uh, digesting all those meals and 
like giving me the energy I need to go about doing my business every day. It's such a big part of your body, this tummy, so you need to get that ball of golden light nice and big so it just engulfs your whole tummy. It's just glowing with this golden light. Thank you, tummy. Then the next part of my body, I zap with kindness. <clears throat> and I pretty much have the same sort of gratitude for this part of my body is my breath. Thank you, breath. On so many levels, the breath um, receives my kindness. My breath uh, was there the day I was born. The breath will be there the day I die. The breath will be beside me like a good friend. Every moment of my life, Thank you, breath. And on another level, the breath has brought me so many uh, peaceful and delicious meditations. Thank you, breath. Through this uh, breath meditation, or the Pali word, uh, Anapanasati meditation, the breath has brought me some beautiful meditations. And as we'll talk about uh, later on, uh, the, the beautiful breath. And this part of the meditation where the breath just slows down, becomes so smooth and light and gentle. This is what uh, I don't know what other meditation teachers call it, but Ajahn Brahm calls it the beautiful breath or the delightful breath. And that there, th those are its characteristics. It has a texture that is light. It has a texture that is soft. It has a texture that is smooth. And this beautiful breath or delightful breath is always accompanied by what Ajahn Brahm calls his bliss, or at, uh, on a more basic level, um, pleasant sensation. That's a great part of the meditation that uh, I wish everybody can experience. And once you experience it once, uh, there's, it, it teaches you how to get to it um, further times. Because this uh, beautiful part, beautiful breath, bliss, uh, delightful breath, it uh, takes you on to these other parts of the meditation. Ajahn Brahm is known to describe um, as nimittas. These are beautiful lights in the mind. And then, of course, Ajahn Brahm's teaching on jhanas, he calls this beautiful breath and nimittas. Like a, like a stepping point or turning point uh, or springboard, if you like, into the jhanas. So I have this gratitude uh, to my breath. Uh, I send metta, kindness to my breath because I have so much gratitude for it, for bringing me this delightful breath. So please look out for the delightful or beautiful breath later on in your meditation. It may come up. It's very subtle, sometimes hard to see, very easy to walk straight past the delightful breath and not notice it. But if you're in the present moment and you notice those textures I just mentioned, lightness of the breath, softness of the breath, gentleness of the breath, and accompanied by this peaceful sensation and pleasant sensation, then please nurture that. Just add more kindness to it, and you can't go wrong. This is, uh, and, and you be able to watch breath after breath, and just it'll be the most delicious, uh, delightful experience. So, after um, sending metta to the breath, we can now move to the other parts of the body. 
<clears throat> up to the shoulders and uh, down the arms, hands and fingers, just moving that golden light of metta down there, just covering every inch of your body. And then finally we move up to the neck and just like Ajahn Brahm always does, I like to just, if you want to, just wriggle your neck around, give it a stretch. And this actually does in release some sorts of endorphins. Oh, it feels good. So I like to do this as a last offering of just a nice feeling to the body before we kind of put the body to one side and go into the mind. So just noticing that feeling if you wriggle your neck around, how good it feels. Releasing tension and it has pleasant sensation. And then last of all, just noticing the sensations in your head. <coughs> Moving your awareness around to the front of your face and just sending this kindness to all the little muscles around your eyes and mouth. So now that uh, the body is as relaxed as it can possibly be, and the five senses are uh, relaxed, this is the time now we can put the body down. We can let the body go. The body and its five senses, we can uh, put them down. And very uh, gently, with lots of kindness, gentleness, Move our awareness inside into the mind. Not forgetting to bring that big ball of uh, golden light. Just bring that into your mind. Just infusing that golden light of metta, golden light of kindness, all through your mind. What does it look like inside your mind? Just take a moment to notice what you see in there, what it looks like and how it feels. <coughs> so our job as uh, meditators is to hang out with the mind. Allowing the mind to do what it needs to do, not forcing the mind to be still, but allowing the mind to become still by itself. The mind won't become still if you request that it does this and force it to do that demand that it be still. We don't demand the mind stay with us in the present moment. What we do is, instead, is we, we send it kindness or metta. We say, mind, uh, may you be happy and well. And if you want to wander to the left, please wander to the left. If you want to wander to the right, please wander to the right. If you want to wander into the future or the past, then please do that. And that might sound counterintuitive to looking toward having a still mind. But when you bring that level of kindness to your mind, allowing the mind to do what it wants to do, and when the mind looks back at you, it's like it says, Venerable Mudu. This Venerable Mudu is quite a kind person. He's not forcing me to do anything. Why would I want to go into the past or the future? Why would I want to go to the left or the right? I think I'd rather just hang out here with Venerable Mudu. That's what happens when you be kind. 
That's what happens when you be kind to your friends and your family. They want to hang out with you. They don't want to run away and be, go somewhere else. When you're kind, you don't force people to do um, things that, that they don't want to do or force them to do what you want to do instead of what they want to do. And it's just natural, they want to hang out with you because you're kind. You're infused with metta. So please do that to your mind and just see what happens. If the mind wanders off to the left, as soon as you notice that it does that, it will come back to the middle by itself. You don't need to drag it back there. Just be kind to your mind. Bring this kindness with you. And for the next um, uh, five or ten minutes, I'm going to remain silent. Allow you to be with your minds and just see what happens. But please uh, bring that metta with you to your mind and kindness. Don't get upset with your mind if it goes to the left or the right. And then after this next five or ten minutes, I will bring the meditation to a close and we will send uh, metta to um, uh, Ajahn Brahm, our Kalyana Mitta, our friends in the holy life, and all beings. But for the next five or ten minutes, we'll remain silent.
So for the final part of the meditation, please keep your eyes closed and we'll do the metta um, the dedication uh, of the merits from this practice, <coughs> this meditation session, we will offer the merits to our Dharma teachers, to our Kalyanamitta, our fellows in the uh, in, in this uh, life of meditation, our meditation companions, and finally to Ajahn Brahm. So first we think of our, our Dharma teachers, anyone who has taught us meditation, or anyone who's taught us um, um, how to be virtuous, doesn't necessarily have to be Buddhist um, teachers, anyone who has been our teacher in this life to teach us to become uh, more wholesome and virtuous people or to be uh, have been meditation teachers. We share the merits from this practice with them. May they be well, may they be happy. So just visualize those people in your mind whoever they may be. Might be Venerable Novato. He's a very popular teacher here in Albany. My companion, Monk, who lives with me at the Albany Hermitage. One way to visualize sending them a metta, wishing them uh, that they are well, that they are happy, is to just zap them with that golden light. So you imagine their face and you just send them that golden light so that it immerses, immerses them, that healing golden light of loving kindness. And then we move to the next recipient of this metta, this uh, golden light of loving kindness, and that is our fellows, our meditation companions. That could be the people in this room here. Don't worry, we won't drown in the golden light. So just emanate this golden light, this metta, loving kindness to all beings in this room. Our fellows, our fellow meditation companions or Kalyanamitta, the Pali word. May everybody be well, may everybody be happy, may everybody have a peaceful life. without conflict, a peaceful life, a harmonious life. And last of all, please picture Ajahn Brahm in your mind, our main teacher, the monk who's responsible for bringing uh, the success of meditation practice uh, to many, many, many Westerners and others also all over the world. Thank you Ajahn Brahm for um, bringing monks and nuns, ordaining them here in, in Western Australia. Ajahn Brahm, may you be happy May you be well, may you be um, in good health for this 70th uh, birthday you're having on the 7th of August, 2021. Ajahn Brahm, may you continue to teach 
and inspire all of us so that we can be happier and lead wholesome lives and so that we ourselves as monks, as nuns, as lay people, so we can share your teaching with others as well, as many of us do, through YouTube and other ways. So just imagining Ajahn Brahm, if you can picture his face in your mind, his happy face, He's a happy monk. I lived with him for you know, close to eight years. And he walks the talk. Lived with him very, very closely. I was privileged enough to share office space with him during the work period we have each day. Spent a lot of time very, very close to Ajahn Brahm. Never seen him get angry with anyone. All I ever saw, anyone that came across his path was kindness, compassion, care. He definitely walks the talk. He's worthy of respect. He'll do anything for anybody. He's traveled halfway across the world just to uh, requests from people to come and teach meditation. ordained me. He was patient with me, just as he is with every other monk and nun. We don't all turn up at Bodhanyana Monastery, put on the brown robe and become enlightened. It's hard work. And Ajahn Brahm has to um, basically be patient with all these monks and all their defilements and their idiosyncrasies, and their habits, and all these uh, ways of life they have in, his, in their heads. But little by little, bit by bit, these people come and ordain with Ajahn Brahm, and these lay people come to t uh, become his disciples, and all of us, the lay people and the monastics, after time we become softer and kinder. It's true, I've seen it in myself as well. Little by little, just stay with the practice. Keep listening to um, the kind words from Ajahn Brahm. And it's automatic, you'll become another fine uh, human being in this world that can share those same qualities with others. Kindness, softness, compassion. So I'm going to ring the gong three times now to end this uh, meditation. And uh, Wait till the sound of the last gong before you come out of meditation. And please, when you come out of the meditation, smile. Please join in special dedication for Ajahn Brahm, I'd like to do the three over-the-top sadhus. Some of you know that here, so please just join in. Sadhu means awesome. So I'd like to dedicate these three over-the-top sadhus, if we can do them nice and loud, Ajahn Brahm will be able to hear them and it should come through this microphone. So here we go. Sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> That's the three over the top sadhus. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye.